Hi, everyone, and thank you for coming. I appreciate it's such a good turnout. I think it's finals week, so you know we didn't know about student turnout, but it's great to have so many of you here. So uh, I just wanted to welcome you all to the third installment of our 2013-2014 Workforce Lecture Series. Um, let's see. So as I said, we're in the third one. We've got quite a few more. The next one, January 9th, motivational interviewing. So save the date and keep those on your calendars. And today we have a special presentation for you, if you've seen all my advertising. What's new in Washington? A panel on workforce policy and practice level activities to support the implementation of evidence-based practice. It's kind of a mouthful. So, but it's an important discussion and we have some state representatives from Olympia and Lacey, right? Okay, that came all the way up from here. So we're very happy to welcome them here and that they made the drive. And um, I want to first introduce Eric Bruns, PhD. He is our moderator today. And he is a clinical psychologist and associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington School of Medicine. His research and other professional activities focus on public child serving systems and how to maximize their positive effects on youth with behavioral health needs and their families. He's nationally known for his research and development uh, work around the wraparound process, school mental health services, and how to set up public systems to best support effective practices. Um, in support of Eric Trupin, PhD, he co-directs the Washington State Children's Evidence-Based Practice Institute. Um, and first, we have Corey Redman in the middle here. He's a juvenile court program administrator with the Juvenile Justice and Rehabilitation Administration. Uh, he oversees state funding that passes from the legislature through Juvenile Justice and Rehabilitation Administration to the juvenile courts. Um, the funding provided to these juvenile courts is used on evidence-based programs, disposition alternatives, and county-administered probation services. Um, he also manages and oversees the quality assurance activities associated with juvenile court evidence-based programs. And our second member of the panel, Greg Endler, over here on your left, he is Children's Mental Health Program Administrator with the Division of Behavioral Health and Service Integration Administration. Greg currently coordinates the cross-system efforts of House Bill 2536 with the goal of increasing evidence and research-based practices within child-serving systems. He is a member of the Creating Connection Grant, working to strengthen the collaboration between the Department of Social and Health Services Children's Administration and Community Mental Health assists in the rollout and implementation of the wraparound with intensive services and is the lead for Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery in implementing the CANS uh, Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths Assessment within the WISE program. And last but not least, we have Tim Kelly. Tim, you were very humble with your statement, so I apologize. <laughs> but uh, he is the statewide manager of evidence-based practices and performance-based contracting with the Children's Administration. So please give a round of applause for our panel. Oh, and one more thing. So for those of you um, who do have a question, please wait for me to bring a microphone to you. Otherwise, we can't get it on the taped recording. And we value your feedback and really would like it on there. OK? Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks so much to these three gentlemen for coming up. Um, I guess we could embellish Tim's description a little bit. I know that he's a dad and a former member of the Air Force, correct? Yep. So there's a couple more things about Tim that you now know. Um, so it, it's, it's wonderful that so many folks came out for the latest installment of um, our evidence-based practice lecture series. Um, typically, what we have um, at these sessions are folks who have developed or conducted research on some specific type of um, evidence-based practice or some sort of adaptation or application thereof. And this is, uh, makes a lot of sense if we're interested in um, implementing practices that are going to improve the health and well-being of children um, and young people and increase our accountability for the services that we deliver. We obviously need research on what practices or packages of practices work. Um, so that we can, um, and also under what conditions they work, for which kids and families, and so forth. Um, so as a result of this you know, huge priority over the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, we have now 
nearly 1,000 published controlled research studies just in children's behavioral health alone. What we don't have as much of is research on how to use this research, okay? Um, so for example, what uh, these guys are struggling with day in and day out and their colleagues is the question of what are the best strategies through which states and large jurisdictions can implement evidence-based practices, not for 100 carefully selected families that might have uh, participated in a research study, but for literally thousands of young people in foster care, thousands of uh, Medicaid uh, beneficiaries who are uh, in need of behavioral health services, um, the thousands of youth who are involved in juvenile justice um, in our state. So for many of us, this really represents um, our new research and policy frontier is not necessarily developing evidence about the programs or the practices, but evidence about how best to mobilize that body of uh, evidence. So the need for determining what works at a system level is important for uh, a couple of big reasons. Um, so although we have these hundreds of research trials that show that we do have interventions that can be effective at reducing uh, juvenile offending, conduct problems, depression, anxiety, the sequela of trauma um, that can promote uh, better parenting among um, uh, parents who may have uh, come in contact with the child welfare system and so forth. What we also know from research is, is that once you actually put these things into real world systems, the effect sizes go from very robust down to uh, much smaller effect sizes, sometimes uh, close to zero on average. And so we have to figure out how to bridge this so-called science to service gap and ask how our public systems um, can build those bridges. Um, the second thing that's really obvious is, is that the nature of the way our country funds and administers um, services to individuals in need of those services um, puts um, systems such as child welfare, behavioral health, juvenile justice really at a central position to, uh, and states, state systems, in a real central position around leading efforts to improve the quality of those services, the effectiveness of those services, and to ask how do we in fact implement evidence-based practices, how do we use the evidence that I was just describing. And so recognizing this, the federal government um, is increasingly rolling out initiatives um, and uh, policy directives, grant programs, including the one uh, that was referenced before from the Administration for Children and Families, that all of these, are at least certainly behavioral health and, and uh, uh, child welfare, as well as the University of Washington are involved in, um, all of these different kind of federal initiatives are increasingly being rolled out to try to in encourage EBP implementation at the state level. So as we'll hear today from our panel, uh, states such as Washington are trying to rise to the occasion and rise to the challenge. Um, all three of these guys in our little prep call we had briefly a few days ago said, no PowerPoint from us, please. And of course, being an academic, that sent me into, an, into a panic, and I quickly threw together a quick PowerPoint. <laughs> um, so like I was saying, we don't necessarily have a whole lot of research, thankfully, because then my, my little dog and pony show will be two minutes long instead of 20, but we don't have a lot of rigorous research about what strategies or investments are most likely to uh, be successful, but we have a lot of theories and frameworks out there as well as case studies from specific states. So just as a little warm up before we hear about strategies here in Washington, um, in the early aughts, um, Rosenheck proposed a few uh, strategies, um, this was specific to uh, adults with uh, serious mental illness, but one could imagine that these broad um, strategies would probably apply to kids' mental health and child welfare, juvenile justice systems as well. Strategies for translating research into practice in public systems. Uh, he concluded there were big four big things. So leadership and construction of leadership coalitions, um, ensuring that the efforts are linked to widely endorsed and clear goals and values, uh, development of communities of, of practice, and a big thing that you'll just see over and over again, the measurement uh, commitment to measurement of implementation, fidelity, and outcomes system-wide. Um, you don't see a whole lot of difference once somebody actually did an empirical study of this question. So uh, Magna Bosco in 2006 reviewed all states' efforts to uh, support evidence-based practice and 
found 106 unique strategies um, when reviewing states' efforts and concluded that there were five big categories of strategies, not dissimilar to Rosenheck's ideas. State infrastructure building, the importance of building relationships among stakeholders, uh, financing strategies, uh, continuous quality management, and training. So what will be interesting is when we hear from um, Corey, Greg, and Tim is to kind of ask, you know, so where are the examples from Washington State? And do they fall into these categories as well? Last thing I'll show you real quick is um, when, we, when we hear about example states out there that have seemingly at some point in their history really focused on this question of how to mobilize the evidence towards positive outcomes for kids, you often hear about the state of Hawaii and uh, the work of Bruce Chorpita, Eric DeLayden, and their colleagues um, in response to the um, Felix lawsuit. Um, as a result of the work that they did um, there, which I'll describe real briefly, they concluded that there were uh, three big things to focus on um, in terms of principles of evidence-based public systems. And they use fancy words. So that's another thing that you know, this allows me to do, is use some fancy words. Maybe we'll hear some more. Uh, empirical ep epistemology is the first principle, which basically just means that you're actually using research to make decisions, decisions about which treatments are going to be prioritized and funded, um, research on how you're actually monitoring system impacts, so using um, validated measures and so forth. The second one, though, is keep it simple. So use fancy words, but do it in a simple way. So parsimony and efficiency. So make sure that your protocols, your measurement, your supervision structures are consistent across your systems, across your providers, uh, across your settings. Use dashboards um, to keep things simple. Use a modular design to evidence-based practices if that will allow for there to be kind of um, one platform on which a lot of the uh, clinical work gets done. And then finally, visibility. Um, so can we actually produce documents and messages that really help people understand how this is getting done and, and disseminate them widely um, to guide the system and to keep people on the same page. Um, so in Hawaii, they applied these principles. Specifically, they used a select set of EBPs that were really carefully matched to their target population. They trained statewide practitioners in a modularized approach to EBP implementation as well. They implemented care coordination for the kids with the most serious and complex needs. And they uh, um, also implemented statewide outcomes monitoring, which is consistent with what a lot of people say is so important. And I really trust these guys' perceptions of what's important in terms of supporting EBP in, in public systems, because they found that when they implemented all of these things, as they added them and refined them, that the trajectory of positive change on standardized instruments uh, for all the kids in their system got better and better as they implemented more and more of those different strategies. So I really trust their take on what an evidence-based system might look like. Um, so turning to our panel, in the end, uh, whether it's Hawaii or any number of other states that have adopted different kinds of strategies, um, each state is unique, and so are the EBPs that they use, uh, the context in which they're using them, the drivers um, for how they will um, uh, respond to the call to implement EBPs. Um, and so we as a field, I think, are really going to learn largely by looking at the state level case studies out there in places like Hawaii. Today, we're going to learn about Washington State's um, current strategies and approaches and what, what's been learned thus far. And so we're going to hear now from, um, in order, Corey from JJ and RA. Uh, I think then we'll hear from Tim from Children's Administration. And then finally, Greg from uh, DBHR or Bezia. Which one do you? Wh who are you? With? Lives underneath. Right. Okay. From the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery. Um, so, with no further ado, um, starting with Corey. I mean, the rule. The first question is just lob a softball to you guys. How would you describe what characterizes your agency's um, approach to ensuring that services and strategies uh, in your system are based on what works for kids and families? You guys hear me okay? So on the drive up, we were deciding who would go first. And um, since uh, I think juvenile justice has the most experience um, with regards to the three um, areas represented here, um, you know, we thought I would lead. So um, 
we have about uh, eight minutes or so, according to Eric. So what um, I wanted to do is, because there is a history, I'm going to walk you along briefly along my timeline of activities with regards to juvenile justice. Um, as Eric said, I do work for um, a state agency, the Juvenile Justice and Rehabilitation Administration, but my working title is a juvenile court program administrator. So I'm, I find myself in a good position because I get to monitor the juvenile courts across the state and their activities with regards to evidence-based programs and obviously my own agency in, in, in JR, um, Juvenile Rehabilitation. So when I say JR, that's the state agency. So as you guys probably know in corrections, and juvenile corrections is no, no different, um, our approach is generally community safety and accountability and, and what's different from adults is, well, and that's changing, but is rehabilitation. And for years and years, decades, um, rehabilitation meant something very specific um, and it varied. In our state, um, in about the mid-90s, we started a culture change, um, and, and we took some leader, lead um, in JR. Um, we started doing some DBT and some mentoring um, in, in Echo Glen up in King County. Well, I'm not up. We're in King County now, but at Echo Glen Children's Center and, um, and in our regional uh, parole office, we started doing some mentoring. Um, and then in 1997, and it's interesting, as what Eric was pointing out, I'm going to allude to about um, what it really takes, um, support from leaders and financers and whatnot. But in 1997, our state legislature passed the Juvenile, um, excuse me, Community Juvenile Accountability Act, um, which was the beginning of our state's specific investment um, in evidence-based, well, they weren't called evidence-based, they were uh, research-based programs um, that showed cost-effectiveness with juveniles. Um, and those programs um, that at the time, we included uh, aggression replacement training or art coordination of services, functional family therapy, and multi-systemic therapy. Um, and then we just kind of leapt off uh, in good hope. We worked with um, model developers, found those programs. Um, they weren't from the state of Washington. They were from across the country, and we implemented those in our juvenile court settings. Um, the juvenile courts kind of led, and JRA quickly followed. Um, with an urge uh, and a direction from our uh, state legislature. So in 2001, um, we uh, in JR moved uh, and created our integrated treatment model, which was uh, incorporate CBT treatments throughout the JR continuum of care, which is our residential programming, our state institutions, community facilities, and parole programs. And those specifically, um, uh, our main residential care or treatment model is DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, and we also do functional family parole, which is derived from functional family therapy out in our community regions. And what's integrated about it is we also do ART, we also have FFT, we also have multidimensional treatment foster care, we also have family integrated transitions for our co-occurring population. Um, and so it started to build and build. Um, and that was in 2001. In 2002, um, the Washington State Institute for Public Policy, which you may or may not know and uh, who they are, I'm sure you do, but they're the, uh, the research arm for the legislature. Legislature leans on them quite a bit, especially around um, state programming and state investment in dollars. Um, in 2002, they uh, published a report um, about EBPs um, and that they would reduce recidivism in juvenile justice, but only if they were faithfully adhered to um, with the original program design, um, which of course now, nowadays that makes tons of sense for us, but at the time it was it was something new and, and learned. Um, it used to be that you can get trained, train the trainer, and go back and I'm doing ART or I'm doing FFT, and that obviously wasn't the case. Um, shortly after that, and based on that finding, uh, the legislature was again involved the following year in 2003 and directed WISIP to develop some recommended quality control standards to ensure um, that we were doing and implementing these programs as designed and with fidelity. And then that then, and this is in 2004, it began um, the still ongoing journey of um, program quality assurance. Um, and then the one thing I think that's added now that has kind of began the ramp up in the mid aughts, as it was said, um, is our state legislature was um, being faced with um, the burden of having to potentially build two to three prisons um, in, by 2020, 2030. And uh, obviously uh, at that time we were facing some you know, economic downturn. At the time we didn't know how much. Um, so again, the legislature turned to Institute for Public Policy and said, what can be done to help us not do this? And their response to that was, um, if we were to further invest from a state's perspective in evidence-based programs, 
that we could um, potentially take a prison or two or three offline from having to be built, which is millions and hundreds of millions of dollars, as it would turn out. So as a result, um, our legislature invested in, in juvenile justice, um, both in juvenile courts and JR, uh, in Department of Corrections, um, Department of Early Learning, and, um, and those programs are still being invested. And that was in a report in 2006. In 2008, um, millions of dollars were funneled into those areas for evidence-based programming. Um, and uh, to this day, and, and, I'll, and I'll be in, and I'll turn it over to Tim here in a second, um, our, our current path is um, we still have these programs, um, and we're still operating. Um, and, you know, I see many people in this room that I've worked with and continue to work with. Um, our path now is to, is to build upon our inventory of programs, our menu of programs, um, so that uh, we can continue to move in evidence-based uh, fashion. So programs that are, would be considering promising um, in, in one area that we can move into juvenile justice and with research and quality assurance for an evidence-based practice and um, continue to build um, what we have built upon already. Corey, before you turn it back to Tim, you still yeah. got a couple of minutes. I was wondering, oh. I know that RDA, the Research mm -hmm. and Data Analysis Division of DBHR, um, or DSHS, or DSHS, I'm sorry, yeah. um, has done some evaluations mm -hmm. so that you can actually cite uh, evidence that specific things that you all did worked in Washington. They weren't just based on evidence right. pulled together and into an in innovative package, but right. that it actually worked here. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, um, I can. Uh, and actually, Institute for uh, Public Policy, so WISIP, um, all along has been also requested, so I'll get to the RDA piece in just a second. But, um, you know, those earlier programs I had mentioned, ART, FFT, MST, um, they were directed by the legislature to also um, research those as they were implemented in our state. So um, there is data on that. Um, with regards to RDA, um, like it is now, and I'm looking at Sarah, and I know the struggles of just, um, there's not a ton of resources to go around, nor is there a lot of money to go around to research those programs. Even though RDA is under um, our, our, our umbrella, so to speak, um, they have done some preliminary outcome studies, and they've been promising with regards to the juvenile justice programs, um, but more work and more research needs to be done. But yes, that certainly has been, um, it hasn't been with good faith only. Um, the legislature wants data. The, the new members of our legislature, um, they're much more savvy than they've ever been, and they want proof and, um, and research and is the way to do it, for sure. Jim Kelly from so Children's Administration. I'm sorry? Thank you. So at Children's, it's a bit of a different story, right? We, we really had a different path down evidence-based practices and how it evolved. You know, for... Gotta lean into it, buddy. So, is that better? Is it worse? All right. So for us, our focus is around the parent and the parent's ability to safely parent their children. You know, and as many of you know that there is, uh, at this point, the evidence is uh, not as strong as it is, let's say, with juvenile justice and the ability to um, recidivate or mental health and restorative functioning. Uh, so for us, it's, it's been a very different path. Um, you know, we, we really started off with a, a time of just doing something evidence-based. Really, and, and the system behind that was Cheryl Stephanie came over from juvenile justice and said, so tell me how your services work. How effective are they? And, and we just kind of smiled. <laughs> we were like, well, you know, some are. You know, and some aren't. We don't really have a very clear, concerted understanding about that. And so we really just started somewhere, right? And so I think our first evidence-based practice, the dates kind of get jumbled over time, but uh, home builders, functional family therapy, and PCIT, were really kind of our first four steps. And they, were, they really made sense, right? Uh, you know, we, we clearly have an ad adolescent population that uh, families struggle with, we struggle with, and something to support families with that. And Home Builders, right, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, is uh, a service that is around, uh, it's, it's contextual. It's a family who's at imminent risk for out-of-home placement. And then uh, uh, PCIT, Parent-Child Interaction Therapy, kind of comes from the mental health side, but is very clearly shown to be able to help a parent parent a child who has difficult behaviors, right? And so whether it's to help that child uh, do better in their life, or if it's to help that parent do better in parenting and be a safe parent, it's kind of two sides of the same coin. 
Uh, and then we, we kind of, so, so that was our strategy, right? That was our initial strategy. There, there wasn't a lot of directive evidence that it, it really prevented uh, the reoccurrence of abuse or improved the well-being, you know, well, except for PCIT, but within our child, child welfare setting. And then we went into this phase of training. Uh, and, and, and many of you probably know Kimberly Shoecraft. Uh, she's an employee of the state, and, and she's phenomenal, right? She's trained in uh, uh, lots of evidence-based practices as a trainer. And, uh, and, and she, she, um, she remembers that time not so well because we really just did a lot of training. But our, we didn't have the implementation down, right? So we didn't have the supports within our agency. Uh, we didn't have just the full understanding of what it took to implement evidence-based practices. And, and that kind of takes us into the strategies that we're at now, right? And, and, I, and I hope that my predecessor will say, when they're giving a similar talk, that this, we kind of went into the time of reason. Um, because we formed a partnership with the University of Washington, the Evidence-Based Practice Institute, where we, we get, you know, not only are, do we have a lot of experts, you know, Randy Hart, I think many of you are familiar, he's our Deputy Assistant Secretary, he's been part of Children's Administration for a very long time, and is a huge advocate of evidence-based practices and understands them. So that, in part, with our partnership, has really led us into a different place about what do we do about evidence-based practices, right? Uh, what are our strategies for, you know, identifying services and moving forward is, is really extraordinarily different today than it was when we first started in 2004 or 5, I don't remember, somewhere in that time. Uh, and so it really is a piece about data. You know, we were very fortunate to be able to work with Sarah Walker and to support us in analyzing the limited data that we have available at, at a service level to understand what, where we're being successful, where we're not, and this is very early in the process, but we use data to understand services, to understand our families as much as possible. But we're also doing work uh, with Georgiana, who's not here, and Sue, uh, uh, yeah, Sue Kearns about um, just a sustainable and systematic systemic approach to fidelity, right? That's probably one of the biggest difficulties that we're seeing right now is that a lot of these models um, are just wildly different. Um, I think I'm going off my question. I just had that observation. I hope that's, all right. I was waiting. I was going to head off the moderator who was going to bring me back. Uh, so, so, you know, we're trying to do this uh, work about being something that's implementable, right? Uh, our latest discussion is how do we get fidelity monitoring that's community-based? not just held by Kimberly Shoecraft, by one person, or maybe two people, but how do we make it more integrated into the community so there's expertise in the community? So these are the strategies that we're looking at as we start to implement evidence-based practices within Children's Administration. What are the needs of our families, right, first and foremost, uh, and understanding those, but then, uh, you know, understanding that through data and understanding that through research. Um, and, yeah. I think that's kind of the, the, uh, the, the, the strategies that we see that, that we're bringing to services to identify them and ensure that they're high quality services. Okay, thank you. Greg Engler from DBHR, we'll talk about behavioral health. There's no follow up. I'm sure there'll be some questions. So in behavioral health, um, mental health, is, the work is, began, is still a journey. I mean, that's the easiest way to put it. It's, it's just a big journey that we've begun. Um, it started out with, I mean, have evidence-based practices and research-based practices been used in the mental health system? Yes. To what degree? It varies all over the state. So it's, it's really hard to get a capturing of that. And that's one piece we're working on. But I think it really started out with the movement we're making started out with a lot of pilot programs. Um, the legislature comes in and says, you have a pilot for three sites. Try it. Um, wraparound was an example of that. Um, uh, MST, MTFC, all these different sites were started up to examine the benefit of these types of situations. Unfortunately, they were just pockets. Um, they start out very small. They never seem to go past that point because it always comes back to a funding issue. So we have to come back to that. How do we get the implementation to get to where we need to go? Recently, we've had, if you, most of you haven't discovered, um, we've had a lawsuit placed with on DSHS and HCA, TR versus Quigley, um, which essentially has said that children weren't receiving what they needed to have in a community-based setting um, around the EPSDT rules. So this was a, a multi-year effort to reform the system. Before that, before I go down that line, we have experienced in the mental health world 
cuts upon cuts upon cuts upon cuts. The first thing that goes when uh, the legislature sometimes needs to balance things, sorry, that sounds negative, but is uh, mental health. Um, and so we're now in the phase of we've lived through this pattern of cuts. And I think now with the implementation of this lawsuit, whether you want to perceive that as good or bad, um, has now changed the direction and course and the trajectory of where we hopefully we see ourselves going in the, in the future. Um, we have now, with the plaintiffs that when we place the lawsuit on us, uh, worked together with our partners in DSHS and HCA to develop um, wraparound with intensive services that is going to be rolled out in the next five years across the whole entire state um, and be available across the whole entire state. So we're working on doing that, knowing that we are also building a plane as we're flying it. So it's a, we're really moving fast to get this going, knowing that we're going to change and reinvent and change and reinvent and keep going, following the research-based model of wraparound. Um, and that's the important part I want to say is wraparound is a research-based practice. <laughs> so we are implementing that. So that's one of the huge changes we have. So that's going to change, again, the landscape, as well as we've been working at um, DBR, DBHR and working with Harborview and Lucy Berliner um, in the CB, trauma focused CBT and CBT plus efforts and using federal block grant funding, mental health block grant funding to invest um, training dollars into training for CBT um, out in the state. So we make available to providers across the state um, to get trained in CBT plus and um, trauma focused CBT to make sure that we have the infrastructure built up, which is another point that you spoke about. Um, we realize we have an infrastructure challenge. Um, how do you get something broadly put across everywhere quickly, efficiently, um, with fidelity, um, with good outcomes, and making sure all that's there? So we are lasering into how we can do that, but also starting with the end in mind, that we're looking really at outcomes. Um, for us, the most important thing is, is the kiddo getting better? Is the adult getting better? Um, you can jump through a lot of hoops sometimes to get to the end goal and still not get better. So what is it that makes it? So we're also working with um, as Lucy Berliner in her shop um, at Harborview, looking at we are coining the phrase as everyday fidelity. Um, the, what are the key fundamental pieces that need to be involved to make sure that this EVP, RBP can move forward in looking at that? Um, so. We have a lot of partnerships with the University of Washington in a lot of different reasons, areas, as well as working very tightly with Eric here at the Wraparound Initiative and WISE and the rollout of that. Um, so I hope that we are changing the trajectory of mental health for kiddos. Um, I actually don't hope I know we are. Um, it's just going to take some time. And I think with the right investment and the, given the time, I think we're going to see changes to the mental health structure within Washington State. And I could ask you the uh, same question I asked Corey partly because I kind of know the answer, but there's also a strategy inherent in the settlement agreement around consistent monitoring of the needs and then over time the outcomes of the youth who would be involved in that new way of delivering community-based services, correct? Correct. There's the, there's the Washington State Performance Indicators, which is, I'm probably not getting the whole acronym right, I apologize. It's one measure, but then there's also just strictly, you related to the wraparound with intensive services called WISE um, outcomes, monitoring the outcomes of the youth entering into that service. So there's very strong guidance as to our plaintiffs are looking for end goals in mind, kids getting better. Mm -hmm. So we are very data driven and more so I think every day we get more data driven. Um, just like Corey mentioned with the legislature being so savvy, everything is about numbers and data. Are you moving things the right way? Okay. Thank you. So um, one follow-up question, you guys kind of address this a little bit, but if in turn um, you want to speak any more about um, some of the biggest challenges or the next frontiers um, that you see in front of you um, building on that history, Corey first, what are, what are some of the biggest challenges to trying to take this on besides just funding? This wasn't scripted. Right, not at all. No, I like it. Um, you know, I think uh, for us in juvenile justice, I think the challenge and um, Aside from funding, because that's a, that's a big part, is um, for us, there, we have been doing many of these programs for, for many years. And just recently, we've had the situation of 
and I spoke a little bit about it also, is this the saturation point where a lot of kids get ART multiple times because they get in and out of juvenile justice. Um, they get FFT multiple times. And, and even from a research standpoint, which, which, which turn through FFT did it? You know, those kinds of things that we're finding challenges. So I think um, a challenge that we're going to really push ourselves for are looking at promising programs uh, a little more closely uh, to build our menu. And I mentioned that earlier, building the menu to make sure we're going to be able to reach kids um, with specific needs, um, specific cultures, um, specific areas of the state. I mean, we've got to be look at more broadly on those kinds of programs and uh, that could work for them so that you know all kids get an opportunity to to spend time and um, benefit from these services so that's our big challenge now and of course that all comes down to funding it comes down to data and research and um, but but that um, would be our biggest push right now Tim you know I think our, our um, it was challenge oh in the way ahead so uh, I think one of our biggest challenges is that our families that come to us really, um, it, it's not just that they don't know how to parent, right? Or that they have some misconception that uh, using this parenting technique is a good idea. Uh, overwhelmingly, the families that we see are uh, in poverty or you know, would be classified as uh, that they have uh, significant mental health issues. There might be domestic violence. There might be substance abuse. And so, you know, we've taken some initial steps around trying to do that, right? So one of the initial things that we saw early on was we saw a fair, or we believed, we didn't see it because we didn't have the data yet, but we believed that we were experiencing a fair attrition rate. Families were dropping out. And it was tough, right? And our social workers were, were picking up on that. And so we've recently implemented uh, what we call an enhancement in our evidence-based practices. And, and so what we've done is... Uh, it started with Triple P, and, and uh, Sue Kearns was fantastic to work with in, in helping us do this, hopefully right, and setting it up so that we can evaluate it as we move forward. But we, we took an evidence-based practice, and then we, we allowed the therapist to also have to be paid to have time to spend with the family to help them participate in the evidence-based practice, right? Because there's so much, you know, the way I tend to talk about it, there's so much chaos in this family's life by the time we encounter them that their ability to sit down and do a therapeutic intervention on any given day of the week is, is, is likely going to be challenged, right? So they're freaked out because there's not enough food in the house, or they can't pay their bills, or there's a big squabble with their parents, or they... And so how do we make time to allow, to help that parent's immediate needs, then hopefully enabling them to attend to the larger kind of systemic, like how to be a good parent? So I think that's been one of our big challenges is that uh, just to come into a family's life that has come to the attention because of their uh, inability to create safety for their children in their own home and then ask them to join us in safe care is, is tough, right? They're, they're not always at that level with us. So how do we support them in getting there with us? I think that's been probably um, one of the biggest challenges and ones that we're trying to take steps, but really they're just informed, I hate saying this, Best guesses. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's just, what's that? Hypothesis. Hypothesis. That's a much better way. Um, and in, uh, a, a, a grassroots informed hypothesis. Um, I think that's the big one. And then the other one is which EVPs to add? You know, what do we do next? Uh, I think many of you may know that we're adopting uh, promoting first relationships as a formal evidence based practice within children's. You know, that was a, a practice driven decision. Uh, Many of you probably also know that we are focusing, uh, because we have identified through data that children birth to three, uh, ha we need to improve the outcomes of those children that, that we encounter. And that's a very vulnerable, very vulnerable time. So that was a practice decision that left, led to a service selection uh, identification in trying to do that. But it's, you know, it, is it eight EBPs? Is it nine EBPs that the system needs? Is it 12? You know, and how many do we need? And how many people do we need trained? Right? If we train 100 people right now, uh, I would guess that 50 of them won't get a referral for three months. So how do we know exactly how many people to train and how many EBPs? I think that's where we have to head into the future. And again, that's where the partnership with the EBPI has been just in helping us think about it. Right? Having someone who reads all this stuff and makes lots of PowerPoints. Um, <laughs> To, to, to sit down and just I, maybe calm us down a little bit and get us to think more methodically. And we, we also have started a quarterly meeting with our providers as a, as a venue, you know, with the people who deliver evidence-based practices 
to give us feedback regularly. So yeah, that's challenges in the future. PowerPoints, PowerPoints. are definitely an evidence-based way of <laughs> making people relax, sometimes to the point of sleeping. Yes. <laughs> Greg, how about yourself and DBHRs? I think the, the biggest thing we run into, I you know, piggyback on what Tim said, is um, infrastructure. It really comes down to building the infrastructure, um, training the individuals on the front line, and the hard work that therapists do on the front line every single day, um, but they're really not rewarded for it. Sorry, come back to money again. They're really not rewarded for it, and if you go into private practice, it's a different scenario. So they're not totally rewarded, so turnover happens. We deal with the turnover issues, um, and getting people trained and keeping the workforce sustained and competent and, and ready to do it at any time when needed. So I think the building the infrastructure is going to be the, and is, the hardest challenge for us as we move forward. Um, yeah, that's probably the, what I could encapsulate in. We're working with, again, the University of Washington as well to do a gaps analysis across the state. Um, and I think, we, I can't remember who it was, I wanted to give the credit to the person, but I can't remember who I'm working with. I know Jessica's on it. <laughs> and Sarah, thank you, Sarah. And we're working with um, Sue Curran's also on a true cost study of implementing these different things too. So between the partnership, identifying within the state of Washington where the um, where we have good things going on, where are we at deficits, what are we missing, um, to inform our decisions. Because we just don't want to start picking apples off the tree and throwing it at our providers saying do this. We want to make very educated decisions about what we endorse or what we support or what we're even going to put money behind um, possibly to, to move forward. Um, the true study is also just understanding the provider network that we deal with is that understanding that when you say do something, well, it's not as simple as just saying do that. There's employee costs, there's infrastructure costs, there's IT costs, there's turnover, there's union issues. There's all kinds of different things that they run into. So if you say this costs $200 to implement, it may actually cost $1,200 to implement. So it's taking that true cost and working with WISUP as um, on the financial leg to see what that's going to impact to be so we can speak educatedly about what we're moving forward in. So, Tim, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, you know, um, you know Greg was saying something and it, it, uh, it, you know, probably our biggest challenge, one of our biggest challenges that he referenced that I, I failed to is, is turnover, staff turnover. Uh, that is probably uh, one of the key things that uh, is going to prohibit us from well, that stood in our way. It's, it's not going to. It's not going to prohibit us, right? Where we're going to find a way around it. And so, one of the things we've done, uh, and several of our providers who are in the audience uh, have participated, is we started a rate setting, for doing exactly what you talked about. So we start with our evidence-based practices, and um, and it was really rather historic for children. So it was actually really nice to be part of this because we very transparently we put a Excel sheet on a WebEx and we just walk through it. Uh, and we said, you know, here's this piece and here's this requirement, you know, and, you, and we require you to participate in, uh, in this and that. And, and, and so we're hopefully doing that to reduce turnover. But, um, you know, we can go out, you know, so, I mean, there's tons of examples. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go out and do a safe care training, right, four people. And we can turn around and six months later all four of them are gone. Right, and, and so that's just not a sustainable, so the thing we've tried to do is this rate setting. So, because it, it moves us in a direction of hopefully paying a living wage, right? In, in a wage that agencies then are supported in, in paying their staff better and making it a place that uh, staff can stay at. Um, because it is, it, 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 it will stand in our way of being able to implement systemically. So I promised you guys that uh, you'd have the questions you knew in advance, and then we would turn it over to the audience who will throw you all number of things. Um, I'm going to start. Uh, so I'm, I'm cheating. But one thing that's just occurred to me is, is that we've heard um, three different perspectives from three different agencies. We know that, um, for example, 60, 70 percent of kids involved in child welfare have potentially some kind of mental health, behavioral health problems, same thing with JRI, JJRI, probably even higher. Is there, to your perception, a DSHS-wide strategy um, that joins these efforts in some systematic way? I mean, the, like, the, 
I think DSHS has, has and healthcare authority have worked together. Historically, there has been working together within our administration. Has it always been perfect? No. Um, I could say, like, has the UW always worked well together? No. So it's if you think any system, you have large, massive systems. Sometimes there's challenges in working together. So over the last, I, I would think, I could probably think back, at least in my career with the state so far, there has been this push toward integration of working together, um, pulling people to this, the whole wraparound model, pulling people to the tables, working cases, staffing cases together. Um, if there's JJRA involved, call them to the table. and get. So we are working and moving in that direction. I think that in the values of um, WISE within that rollout and that settlement between DSHS and HCA is, again, going with that systems of care, pulling people all together, working collaboratively for that individual or family to come to a better outcome. Um, there are other forces that come into play that we have I mean, House Bill 2536 has asked us to work on increasing evidence and research-based practices together in doing that, and which we are. Um, so sometimes the forces are internal, sometimes the forces are external, sometimes they're legislative, um, sometimes they're lawsuit-driven. Um, but I, to answer your question in short, yes, we are working together. Um, do we have more work to do? Yes. Others thoughts? Either of you guys have anything to add? No, I think the only thing I'll add is um, in my almost 20 years, uh, there's been the no wrong, no wrong door. Um, there's been, right, remember that. Um, there's been various initiatives, and they're not funded. They're just policy level. Um, there is a goal. I think we would always want to work together, but I reiterate. Um, the challenge is um, sustainability, yeah, and it usually comes down to funding or change in leadership. Right. right. <laughs> so we have over uh, 20 minutes, and I bet you all have more interesting questions to ask than I can think of at this point. So why don't we turn it over to the uh, audience and the attendees to today's session, and what questions do you have for these representatives from different parts of uh, DSHS? Scott? We have a handheld mic. Please wait for the mic if you're called upon. OK. Um, so I guess my question is a follow-up to Eric's, which is you know, evidence-based practices have target populations. And if somebody's outside of that target population, that developer of that EBP says, nope, can't, you know, can't do that, even though they might fit you know, some of the criteria for that EBP. What kind of flexibility is there going to be, for example, with Children's Administration, where you have a you have a unique challenge because you have a myriad of kids, and I appreciate that you've identified those you know zero to three population, but you know there's there's whole other you know other populations in Children's Administration that are being served. So I guess my question is to follow up with Eric is like if you have you know families or kids um, that have these you know multiple problems. Will they be able to get an evidence-based practice if they don't exactly fit that target population? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Good. Didn't make you sense to start, me. Tim? So. Yeah, so I've got to <laughs> Since it makes sense. sense. Next yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. Next. Oh, there you go. You know, um, it really depends on the evidence-based practice. To be honest with you, uh, in in my experience, some are more rigid than others. Uh, I would say, you know, uh, Triple P is probably our broadest brush that uh, really can in include a lot of different families that look very differently. Um, that really, I'm trying to rack my brain, has the least prohibitions, right? Some of the, usually where you bump into something is, um, you know, probably our biggest bump is, the biggest thing that we bump into is developmentally delayed people and having, because you know most of these are cognitive behavioral interventions, um, so you know, and that gets back, Scott, to the earlier question that we really continue to have is like, you know, are we ever going to be able to hit all the needs of our families that come to the door and have something on the shelf that's evidence based that says, here you go, this fits your needs, and and it's 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 unclear that we're going to be able to do that uh, with the current strategies in in front of us. Um, we do have flexibility in some, and you know, home builders is absolutely rigid. If that family is not at imminent risk, right? If something doesn't happen right now, they're going to get placed. They're, they're, um, they stay true to that, you know, and, and, and so that's, that's their choice. Whereas with Triple P, it's much broader, right? So if we have dynamics with the parent and the child, that's a pretty broad statement, 
it, it allows us to do different things. And PFR really is uh, uh, promoting first relationships. I, I'm, I'm very excited about this because it's really just, I think it takes it, anybody, birth to three, a caregiver and a child. It's like you don't, there's no stipulations. It's just if you want to have a better matching relationship with your child, then, you know, same with incredible years. Corey or uh, Greg, anything to add to the question of how do you ensure that things can be both evidence-based as well as flexible or individualized? Well, I don't know if I have anything of value to add on top of that, but, but I will make a comment. And, and I think um, in juvenile justice, um, one, it's we have, they have to be in the juvenile justice system, unfortunately. Um, but we have risk assessments. We have eligibility markers that aren't so specific. Um, some of them like family dysfunction, so MST, FFT. Um, you know, we found that for youth to be youth to be successful in reintegrating, especially coming from our institutions, um, working with the families critical. That's why we moved our parole model to a family-based uh, intervention. Uh, and then it's what's the needs of the family. Uh, what's the needs of the youth. So we try to tailor, and our menu of programs I think does a fairly good job of that, but it goes back to my earlier comment of, and what Tim just reiterated is, you know, what's, what else can we do? What can, how can we continue to build so that there aren't special populations like substance abusing um, and even sex offenders or youth with sex offenses, um, which we don't have programs for them specifically. Um, with regards to evidence-based programming, there is definitely programming out there, and that's specific to an outcome of recidivism. So there's still challenges, but I think we do have some flexibility, um, and we have a menu of programs where we can try to fit kids in, but it's, it is a challenge, for sure. I could only add that as we make our, that's in our vision of where we're going in children's mental health, is really about choosing or selecting or endorsing EVPs, RVPs, that offer that flexibility. We don't want to choose something that's so rigid that a provider is locked down to just having to follow this prescriptive thing to the T because it's not realistic. I mean, you talked about the modular model of Hawaii that there needs to be that flexibility and that certain clinical judgment that occurs and has flexibility available to them. So that we are, that's in our strategic vision of where we're going is we want to make sure that we offer flexibility. I think it's worth noting that the inventory that was um, generated as a result of uh, Bill 2536 does include at least one modular approach to um, providing treatment to kids. Um, and uh, in addition, there's a few counties, um, yours, um, one of them that's interested in implementing that um, Bruce Chorpita's uh, managing and adapting practice approach to um, assembling the pieces that have been found to be effective of um, manualized evidence-based practices in a flexible way and training clinicians to use that approach. So there's, there's some movement and, and opportunities for that in the state, I think. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm Joellen Munson. I'm the Senior Vice President at Child Haven, and we have a bit of contingency here. And we have a foot, from our perspective, in each one of the, the programs that you guys are doing. And so part of my question does also have to do with that element of the flexibility of who all is being reached out to and how you ensure that you're actually be able, being able to get to the table. Because we are doing um, evidence-based practice. Our population is birth to five, and we're doing triple P and PCIT and have done um, PFR. Um, but on, like, for example, the TR lawsuit, um, we had representatives go and talk about that, and they were kind of saying, well, we're specifically going to be going through the RSNs. Um, and they're kind of seem to be looking for older children. And that earlier intervention, or there are people that are doing licensed mental health services, but that that's a whole group that wasn't kind of looked at or integrated. And so in your greater model and, and vision for that, um, what are some of those built-in flexibilities of folks that are doing this kind of work but may not be the traditional ones that have been thought about for inclusion in decision-making and, and so decision making. Oh. So inclusion in decision-making about how we're going to move forward with evidence-based practices? Well, or just, just come into the table or to get that input. I mean, so we've sought out and we're working with Sue Kearns and, and some of that information too. But the younger population often seems, it's, it's, everybody's focus often is on well, K-12 or like older folks and um, RSN providing organizations. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of folks that are out there that work with these various populations that also have input and feedback that um, 
don't necessarily have that same access to being able to give information back sure. or that you guys let us know or that we can share our best practice because um, there's things with Harvard that we're working on from their frontiers of innovation for some really creative kinds of things. And, and, and so just that kind of cross-pollination piece. So, you know, I can talk a little bit to this and, and they'll yank the mic away from me as soon as I go too far. Um, because, you know, it was a discussion we, we, we were having just today. Uh, you know, House Bill 2536 requires us to to work, uh, I don't know. So it has a provision that says you must work close together. I don't want to make it sound like, you know, we don't work close together, and this bill is now going to make us work close together. Uh, but it has a provision, what's that? Magical. Yeah. Uh, and, and so because of that, it seemed like a good opportunity to us, and so we're starting to explore this idea about how do we have a DSHS uh, ability to hear from community, right, in an integrated way so that we can understand opportunities that just, you know, because we're, you know, JRA has been doing this for a while and, and they have forged in places that we just haven't been and we've been learning from them. I think, uh, you know, children's, we're moving in a different direction and we're starting to build and grow. And I think we can all learn, but I think we can not only learn from each other internally, but what we recognize uh, and, and are starting to set in, in plan is that we can learn together with our stakeholders. And, I, and so uh, I think you can anticipate soon that, that uh, it's just so early for me to start saying, well, it's going to look like this and this. is It's too early for that. But we definitely see that need, that we need to hear from all of our stakeholders together and, and facilitate that discussion uh, to, and to understand, to address some of our concerns, to address some of your barriers, uh, and, and to learn together. So I, I think that gets to the question you're having. And it's, like I said, it's very timely because it's one we, we literally had at 9 o'clock this morning. Um, and, and thinking about how we can do just that and learn together as a community. Anna, did you get something? No. Is there any is there any specific um, process through which that kind of input is being <coughs> solicited or received through twenty five thirty six or anything else? Or are you saying that's what you all are working on at this time? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. Okay. No. <laughs> all right. Well, I think the message you probably just heard a message to. Uh, Maybe figure it out. Maybe yeah, good. no, we are. It, Great. I, I, would, I would guess in the next 30 days. I would guess you would probably, you know, hopefully our plan, our intent is that in the next 30 days, you know, it's it's a holiday, so it takes a little bit to, to move it around, but it makes sense, and, it, and, uh, and we are moving forward with it. And we definitely hear you that it's, we, we agree that it would be a value. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm April. I've been working with Eric for the last seven years or so in wraparound fidelity. So a couple of terms you guys brought up were really interesting to me. One was community-based fidelity and one was everyday fidelity. And so I understand the theme of flexibility and modularization and everything that we're talking about, but would either one of you guys like to talk a little bit more about, those are two terms that are new to me, so I'd love to just hear a little bit more of the concept. Well, so, I can tell you, talk about my piece, but um, working with, um, Lucy Berliner and the Harvey View Shop um, in the CBT and trauma-focused CBT rollout across the state. S the struggles of providers we hear and the discussions about how are how can we do fidelity? We don't want Kansas to come in and monitor Washington. We don't want to pay thousands upon thousands of dollars to have this done by outside entities. So we were just bantering around is really where the term came from is what is an everyday fidelity? I mean, if you know that we want, that's our goal, is to have fidelity to a model, how can we do it in a way that doesn't have a huge impact on providers? So have we developed that term all the way yet? No. I think we're still early on and we're best in, in contract with them to actually start working and looking at that and stepping backwards through it. So they're examining lots of pockets of excellence across the United States. Um, and from the research and doing research around the United States as well to find out is there a way to implement an everyday fidelity? Um, and I think they're even looking at the Hawaii model as, as part of what they're doing. So I don't think I have much further answer beyond that. But the goal and vision is easy but effective. Universal as well, something Universal that actually like defines fundamental aspects of um, implementation of different kinds of behavioral health treatments that might be across. All across the, the different models that would be monitored regardless of the model mm -hmm. is perhaps one of the characteristics. It looked from our schedule as though the topic's going to be um, discussed in February by Lucy herself at this series, so folks can learn more then. So as far as community-based, I, I was uh, really racking my brain while Greg was talking about where that started, and um, 
she can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, it, it may have started with Rima Ellard um, in early works and discussions. I, I, no? Maybe? Okay. That's where it just, this only place it came to my mind is that, you know, getting, uh, so the expertise, you know, let's talk about safe care, uh, which is a, a, a key um, neglect intervention within child welfare. And we have one person right now in the state. She's a phenomenal person, Kimberly Shoecraft, but it's one. Uh, and she's going to be out of country for five months. So, like, what are we going to do? And so it, it really led us to understand that we need to have a way that we have this integrated more sustainably. And so uh, we're starting the process of looking about how to do that. Uh, you know, another example is, you know, the PCIT therapist or PCIT consultants are here in Seattle. So that doesn't really do really well in supporting a PCIT presence in Spokane. Uh, and so how do we get PCIT in Spokane? Um, you know, we, we were working with our partners at uh, Department of Early Learning, and, and they have people doing PCIT, and one of them Spanish-speaking, and I think is in eastern Washington, and wants to get certified as a consultant. And we're like, wow, that would be a really good idea. <laughs> so I think that's, and then the expertise starts to grow in there, right? There's people in the community who are, who are really experts and have that ability to support the advancement of that service. It's not just dependent upon... Kimberly Shoecraft, who's an expert and can really go and talk about these things, knowledge would be. But we have other people in the community. So that's our intent. It, it seems uh, it's come out through discussions. It seems to be a strategy that will allow evidence-based practices to be more sustainable in the communities. If they're within agencies, if they're within communities, then they have that ability to support more people doing it with fidelity uh, and hopefully successfully. Yes? Hi, I'm Cynthia Dickman, and I have a child welfare background. So I would look to you, Tim. Um, I have a question related to um, the tradition of using kind of a cookie cutter approach to providing services to parents mm -hmm. for years and years. And I think that the department, Children's Administration, has sort of per perpetuated that in a way, even though they don't like it. You know, they want it to be an individualized approach. But even, you know, several years ago, they introduced the um, solution-based casework. Yes. Which the whole emphasis was like strength-based mm -hmm. and look at developmental issues. And I was really pleased to hear that you're looking more at the other co-occurring issues, the poverty, the mental health issues, substance abuse. Because many of the families, they don't fit into that, you know, high-level, uh, privileged uh, class that maybe this w the approach would have been good. And I'm kind of discouraged that, you know, your response to, um, I guess your name is Scott's question about, you know, that uh, some of the evidence-based practice research is not, you know, it's, it's really strict. So I would... <sighs> ask, you know, what, what is the approach in, in uh, working with the research groups in terms of looking at diversity and looking at, you know, the differences and the special needs? Like I have a, a student who is working in, in an office who has a father on her caseload now uh, who needs, he's in prison, but he, he wants and he needs some parent education. And in this day and age, you'd think, you know, there it is online, you know, it's evidence-based, but there's no information, you know, and so worker after worker is struggling to meet that, especially those who have gone to school uh, in graduate programs, they're struggling to meet that requirement for evidence-based, but, you know, it's still sort of back in this cookie cutter, I don't know, could you respond to that? Sure. Um, well, now I'm less sure, but... So I think I hear two things. One is um, our ability to, to identify and reach, well, not identify, but to, to address the systemic issues within families that, that, that come to us, such as poverty, substance abuse. And those, those are really difficult things, um, you know, primarily because we're just not charged with changing that, right? Um, it, it's, it's very difficult um, to do that. Um, you know, on a side note, I've been listening to these TED Talks about poverty and how to change it. And it really is, I mean, it's just amazingly, uh, amazing how complicated it is uh, and how little data there is that drives it. Um, I think one of the changes that's within children's that is going to, is hopefully going to do this uh, is our, our FAR, our uh, Family Assessment Response. 
And I think one of the keys about that, that we're actually integrating into our services, is around getting families connected to the community, uh, whether it be formal or informal support. Now, again, this is just me, right? This is just Tim. And um, I don't think the answer lies within the department that we can fix those things. Um, I, I just, again, this is a personal belief based on what I hear and participate in conversations. It really comes from communities and the ability to help families integrate within that community and find those resources that build stability. And, and, and so I think there's a lot of excitement about our, our FAR intervention, the family assessment response. I think there's also some caution not to oversell it, right? It's going to solve everything. Um, but so, so I think that's one part of your answer is that it's just, it's, and I think it's, as I understand it, it's something that's faced across the nation. How do, because when families come to us, it seems like they have, really it's kind of a cycle and, and we might be one of the last stops on that kind of cycle. Uh, and so they, they really come to us very complex when we uh, get them late, later on. And so hopefully FAR will help us catch them earlier. That's one hope, where it's, it's less entrenched. Uh, the issue about a cookie cutter, you know, um, I think there's, there's some truth to that uh, around how our services work. I've been trained in uh, FFT, um, quasi-trained in safe care. I'm getting ready to go to PFR. I'm going to become certified. I'm very excited about that. Uh, it, you know, and I'm learning more and more that I think the cookie cutter label can really be applied what Scott talked about, which is, um, who, and it's almost a system-imposed regulation in that who has this been tested on? And we really seem to focus on that, right? It's, it's youth who have committed a crime or it's families who have this thing. As far as the interventions themselves, they tend to be pretty flexible. Uh, I think safe care is probably the most, uh, it, well, as far as my knowledge, is the most regimented. And it's a skills-based intervention. So it's pretty clear cut. You know, how, do you, how do you take care of hazards in a room to make sure a child doesn't get access to a poison? You know, it's pretty concrete. But as far as a cookie cutter goes, I, I think it was going to swoop in. Um, as far as a cookie go, my, my experience personally with them is that they're, they're, the actions and the interventions of the therapist are pretty uh, open to them, right? It's a model, it's approach, they're about philosophies. It's, the cookie cutter part is more about who can access that program and who's a good match. So hopefully I answered the question, or at least. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, we are at a time. I think no, that in response to the, one of the one of the sorry, one of the, the big questions was, you know, how do you um, derive good pr practice from research that can be relatively more universal to the population of interest of these three systems or, or others? And you know, there's an emphasis out there about trying to illuminate what the common factors of effective practice are, not for one specific. Uh, slice of the population, but for all families that might be seen within child welfare and so forth. So I think that's one answer that the research field is trying to, um, or, or one approach that the, the field is trying to use to, to try and provide an answer to that question. Um, we could go into more of that kind of uh, uh, discussion, but we are out of time. I want to thank uh, Tim, Corey, and Greg for coming all the way up from uh, the Capital Region for being here today and for all of you for uh, coming out to listen to them speak. Let's give him a big round of applause.